Well, in the past week, the world has kept on spinning. There have been wars, there have been riots, there's been all kinds of uh, rife and conflict between people. And every day in the news, it seems it's filled with negative things. But in this place, we have a chance to find peace and together to come before God. This is the place where we refuel and we equip ourselves to go back out into that world and to live as he would have us live. It's the 12th Sunday after Pentecost, and our service begins on page 185. <coughs> the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church. Open our hearts to the riches of your grace that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love, joy, and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the second book of Samuel, chapter 18, verses 5 to 9, chapter 15, verses 31 to 33. The king ordered Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave orders to all the commandments concerning Absalom. So the, so the army went out into the field against Israel. And the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. The men of Israel were defeated by the servants of David, and the slaughter there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country, and the forests claimed more victims that day than the sword. Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. His head caught fast in the oak, and he was left hanging between heaven and earth, while the mule that was under him went on. And ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Then the Cushite came and the Cushite said, Good tidings for my lord the king. For the Lord has vindicated you this day, delivering you from the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Kishite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? The Kishite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to do you harm 
be, be like that young man. The king was deeply moved and went to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, O oh my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would I had died instead of you? O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. The word of the Lord. Morning all, good morning all. The second reading is taken from the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, 25, 5, 25, 5, and 2. So then, putting away all falsehood, let us all speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you, you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from all you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God is Christ. God forgive you. Therefore be imitators of God, as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant of offering and sacrifice to God. The word of the Lord. Be with you. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus said to the people, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. And I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Gospel of Christ. Praise 
May the words that I speak reflect your word to us this morning. Help us to listen and to act upon what you tell us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin this morning by giving you a simple exercise. Don't worry, you don't have to get up from your seats and you don't have to do any hard thinking. It's a very simple exercise. Imagine that you've been on a long boat trip far away, maybe somewhere in the Pacific Ocean, and all of a sudden a storm breaks out and your boat capsizes and you have to swim to the near shore. Fortunately, you're very close to a small island. You arrive on the island, and when you get there, you're faced with the fact that you didn't send out a signal of distress. Nobody knows where you are. In fact, the likelihood is that you'll never be discovered. You're on this island for the rest of your life. Now, with that scenario in mind, I want you to ask yourself, if you were allowed to have one book with you on that island, one book, what would it be? You can't have two or three books, and there's not going to be much else to do on the island except read. What would that book be? Well, it's a sermon, and you're hearing this in church, so obviously your answer will be the Bible. It's kind of the expected answer. But here's the difficulty. The Bible when you actually read it, when you start to study it, is all about our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. When you look at the Bible, there's almost no page that doesn't describe how you should relate to other people, how you should live in community, how you should learn to put self aside and live self-sacrificially for other people, how you should love them and forgive them and show mercy. The Bible is not a book for a solitary person who will never be with other people. In fact, you might say that it's almost irrelevant if there are no other people around you. Now, I know that sounds terrible, but on that basis, the Bible would be a futile exercise to read if you were never to see another human being again on that island. And that's what we're reminded of as we look at our second lesson today, which is taken from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. He ends the letter by saying this, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Well, you might say immediately, well, it's all about love. So who are you going to love if there's nobody else on that island? Jesus himself gave us two commandments that summarize all the law and the prophets. He said, love God, and then he very quickly moved on and said, and love your neighbor as yourself. So the way that we love God, who is invisible, intangible, is by loving others. As we love each other, we discover God. I think this uh, passage from Ephesians that was read this morning by Joe 
is a key passage when we're thinking about how we should live as Christians. As I said, the Bible is full of advice and full of information about how to live together. But this passage really sums up what I think is most important. First of all, as I read to you just now, Paul says, be imitators of God. That's an interesting word, imitator. It's actually from the Greek. The word imitator or imitation is from memetos, which means to, to copy or to emulate or to be like somebody else. And one word that we get from it in the English language, apart from imitation, is the word mime. If you're ever in a crowded place or walking down a crowded street, on a corner you will sometimes see somebody who's acting the part of a mime. The greatest mime probably that I remember in my life is uh, Marcel Marceau. He was quite extraordinary the way that he would paint a picture with his hands and with his body. He would make you believe that he was standing in front of a window, for instance, and then clambering out of the window. Uh, he would give you the impression that he was in an enclosed place, and he would show you the boundaries by touching the walls. And he made it all look very believable, very relatable. So the word mime uh, could almost be used here in this, uh, this verse, uh, in the beginning of Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul says, be imitators of God. In other words, be mimes. Show through your actions what it means to be a Christian, to live the Christian life. Words are important. The words that we speak to each other have a big effect, but our actions are what is most important. And that's what Jesus was continually trying to get across in his teaching and his ministry. It's what we do, it's how we act toward each other. That's how we become like God. That's how we can live a godly life. And then in Ephesians chapter four, immediately preceding this where he says, be imitators of God, he gives some examples of what we should do, how we should be. For instance, he says, speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. A few weeks ago, I spoke to you about information, disinformation, and misinformation, and how nowadays, especially with artificial intelligence, it's very difficult to make out if what you're reading on the web was written by a human being or by a computer. It's now getting even difficult to tell whether a video that you're looking at is a true representation of real life or whether it has been concocted by somebody sitting in front of a computer. Some information is uh, misinformed it is accidentally conveying untruths, but disinformation is purposeful, purposely trying to uh, alter people's thinking, to make them see reality in a particular way that's not true at all. And so Paul says, speak the truth. Don't speak misinformation or disinformation, but speak the truth to those around you. Now you may think, well, that's pretty easy, and I, I'm not a liar. I like to be honest. But when you think about it, so much of our communication with each other is a concealing of the truth. We're always misleading other people, always disinforming them. Uh, by what we say. And uh, Paul is saying, 
we've got to make it an exercise, a day-by-day -day practice in our lives to speak truth and to always reflect upon what we're saying and to think, am I conveying to that other person what's really the case? Or have I made this up? Or am I trying to somehow deflect them from reality? Speak the truth. Secondly, he says, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. I love that piece of advice. It's a very good advice for married people or people in a close relationship with another person. Uh, you can often, because you're human, get into a misunderstanding or a tiff or an argument. But Paul is saying, before the sun goes down, talk about it. Clear it up. Don't let that misunderstanding, don't let that rift between you continue on through the night and then be even worse the next day and perhaps worse the day after that. Deal with it immediately. So that's the second way, Paul says, that we can imitate God by always speaking the truth. And then he gives some very practical advice to thieves. He says thieves must give up stealing so as to have something to share with the needy. Now, we're not thieves. I doubt that there's anybody in this room that would uh, say that they're a thief. Maybe when we were children, uh, we might have stolen a toy from one of our siblings. But generally speaking, we respect other people's property. But you could expand what Paul is saying here and realize that he's not just talking about thievery or stealing, but any act which is hurtful toward another person, any act that is selfish, any act that is meant to enhance our welfare at the expense of others. He says, give it up. Start to live your life not for yourself, but for other people instead. Uh, give of yourself, share with others, um, and always think of their welfare first. And then next he says, let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up. Now, I think we're all at some point guilty of this, and I don't know about you, but I always feel terrible if I say something to someone that is meant somehow to tear them down or to make them feel le uh, less of themselves. I don't do it purposely. I don't think any of us do, but sometimes we are very aggressive in the way that we speak. And even worse, we're quite often passive aggressive we disguise what we say to another person uh, as being kind and loving. But in actual fact, we're trying to manipulate them so that they'll do things the way we want them to do it. So Paul is saying we uh, need to be very careful and keep a rein on evil talk. Any talk that is meant to, to hurt others or somehow to diminish them. And then next, he says, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice. Now, the place that I have seen this perhaps most, and maybe it's because I hang around these places more than anywhere else, is in churches. Quite often, we can be very hurtful towards other members of the church. We, once again, we may disguise it in a passive aggressive sort of way, but we can say things that are angry and, and uh, standing up for what we consider to be right and telling the other person that they're wrong and they need to change their lives. We say that we're doing it because we're being honest, we're being forthright. Uh, down in the United States, uh, one of the candidates for the presidency, <laughs> uh, 
uh, often says things that are hurtful toward other people. In fact, you almost wonder if he's doing it purposely. I think he is, calling them names, calling them down. And uh, Paul is saying, when we do that, we only diminish ourselves. When we speak ill of another person, when we tear them down, we're doing that to ourselves. I would love when I go to the polls, when I go to elect somebody, I would love to vote for somebody who never tears down his opponent. Do you ever feel that way? Politicians have an awful lot to say to us, but so much of it is tearing down the opposition, saying how bad they are, how, how badly they've, they've run things, and how you're going to be much better than them. I'd love to hear more respectful talk in the political arena, arena where politicians tell us their policies, tell us how they're going to rule the country or the municipality that we live in, and not continually tear down the opposition. I think anybody who serves in politics or any leadership position is doing so in a self-sacrificial way. Most of them could make more money and do better at some other job, but they choose to serve us as politicians. But no sooner do you take on that role than sometimes you find yourself in the same position as all the other politicians, tearing down the opposition. You feel it's the only way that you can get elected. But as I said, I would love to go to vote for my candidate someday and know that they did not do that, that they only spoke about what they were going to do constructively, not how bad the other options on the ballot were. Um, he says, we need to forgive each other as God in Christ has forgiven us. Forgiveness also is a challenge. Uh, sometimes when someone hurts us, when someone does harm to us, and especially to those that we love, we immediately feel angry. We have an innate uh, tendency, I think almost an instinct as human beings, sometimes to wish harm on that person. Well, they deserve it. They have done this awful thing or said this awful thing. I hope they get what they deserve. It's hard to instead forgive them. And not just after you've had your say, after you've spoken your piece and you've uh, torn them down, but right from the beginning to forgive. And not just to make yourself look good or make yourself look holy or Christian, but forgive because you know that you yourself are a sinner. We're all in the same boat. And we need to forgive as God forgives us. So Paul gives us these uh, recommendations and he sums it up by saying that we need to be kind to one another, tender-hearted and forgiving. I love being with people like that, people who are tender-hearted, loving, forgiving. I want to hang around those people because the more that I do, the more I become like them. And so it's been a great privilege to serve in the church over all these years because those are precisely the kind of people that I'm usually with. People who, like me, are not perfect, but are tender-hearted, loving, and seeking to forgive others. Sometimes I spend so much time in the church that I almost forget that the world isn't like that. The people outside the walls of the church quite often are very <coughs> unlike that. But we learn from each other. We learn f by example of those that worship and serve with us. So when Paul says that we need to imitate God, we're also imitating each other. And there's virtually nothing I know about God um, or I've learned about God 
that I haven't received from my brothers and sisters of the church. When I speak about God's love, I'm often thinking about examples of love that I've seen in the church. When I think about God's mercy, God's tenderheartedness, um, I'm not just grasping at abstract truths, but I'm thinking of people that I know that are exactly that way. We can help each other by setting an example and not necessarily even speaking words when we do it. Uh, it was uh, Francis of Assisi who said that we should preach the gospel and use words if necessary. <laughs> and there's that wonderful story about how one day he left the monastery and went into the nearby town of Assisi and he took with him a young novice and he took him along with him and they went to the marketplace and they said hello to some of the people who lived in Assisi. Uh, they traveled around the town and at a certain point he said, okay, let's go back to the monastery now. And the novice said, but I came along with you, Father, because I wanted to learn. I wanted to learn about the gospel from somebody as great as you. And he said, you did. By watching our actions, by watching the way that I treat other people, by watching my love for those around me, you've learned about God. So not a word had to be spoken. It was all done by example. So that's my challenge to you today, to be imitators of God. That sounds like a lofty calling. <laughs> How do you imitate someone who is perfect? How do you in imitate the creator of the universe, somebody who is all holy? Well, as I said, by doing these things that uh, were given in the scripture, by day by day learning to live as Jesus lived and as Paul and others have taught us to live. And when we do that, we live in a better world. We live, as I said at the beginning of this service, in a world that's filled with strife, misunderstanding, and some of the wars that are going on, especially right now in the Middle East and in Ukraine, uh, it seems like there's no resolution to those conflicts. It's so frustrating. You wish that they could just sit down with each other, look into each other's eyes, and really communicate, be tender-hearted, be forgiving, and listen to the other point of view. If we live that way, I think the world that we live in would be a very different place indeed. So this is the place that we practice here at St. Michael's and in churches around the world. Here's how we practice imitating God. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.